stuff back into. So I'm here with uh, Niru Kosla. Is that the right way to pronounce your name? Very great. Great. Thank you very much. Niru is co-founder and executive director of the CK12 Foundation, uh, which folks can learn a lot more about by going to their website, ck12foundation.org. Uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, Niru, uh, you, you folks are doing so much in ways that help uh, uh, students and teachers not just be passive consumers of, of knowledge in their in their classroom and their learning settings, but allow them to really become uh, co-creators of that as well. So maybe you can just kind of update us on uh, what you all are doing and uh, and how schools are able to access your your services. Thank you, thank you, Grant, for giving me this opportunity, and I I absolutely love talking about this because. That is what learning and teaching is all about, to actually, um, you know, get exposed to something and internalize it and then be able to create it in your own world, in your own words. So having said that, we at CK12, um, when we started, we started with phase one. Our phase one was actually giving content and the tools so that people could, um, you know, don't have to do a lot of work in terms of having to create their own stuff. They could start with seeded content that they could customize. And this is one of the reasons that we are an open organization. And we understand that you know teachers and students have to express the content, have to express the learning in ways that shows that it, you know um, they understand it. And so for that reason, we created tools and the content. So what's happened since we did that uh, our first phase was just about putting that content up in our website. Our second stage, and this is about tool maturation, tool and content maturations. Until and unless we have tool and content that are easy for users to use, you're not going to get much expression. Only from the early adopters or the people that take risks will you get that kind of uh, early adoption and, and the daring to do this, I'm going to put myself out there and you know, what I think. And th those are not too many people, but, but it's starting to happen. People are starting to customize to their own needs. And that's what it's all about. Just, you know, so far education has been one size fits all. Unless and until we kind of treat everyone as an individual, you're not going to get a, a success. So the creativity is coming out in very many ways. And, you know, go ahead and ask. No, no, go ahead. So, yeah, so how, how, how is that actually playing out in, in schools? How are you seeing that uh, creativity playing out in schools? Um, okay, so there are, you know, uh, I'm, I'm going to talk about a couple of things that happen over time. Um, at a low charter school leadership public school, they came to us, to us about three or four years ago. The teachers weren't mature. They were young teachers, you know, less than... Uh, you know, less than five years in many cases, and, and very many of them first or second years. And they wanted to really uh, help their students get ahead, but they didn't have content that actually suited their population of students. So one of the first things that they came to, you know, um, um, Luis, or Dr. Luis Waters, who's the CEO, came to me and said, what can we do that might help the teachers to become uh, better teachers. So one thing we did was we brought them around our big table, conference table, and said, let's talk about what needs to be done. From there came this whole curriculum that the teachers in the, in, you know, the whole school, there were about five of them, um, they all got together and created a curriculum. And it suited their students. And if you look now with LPS is fantastic. They've really kind of created their own own vision, their own uh, purpose in teaching learning, and that's become huge. Utah did a project where they took our content and they cut it down to about 300 pages. And that they created for their own content, context. Because what happened with those students, they don't have computers. And so what do you do with that? And that's another one of the issues we're facing. So what they did was they created only what they needed and gave it to the students and said, hey, in the normal publisher's textbook, 
we cannot afford to ask you to own it and write on it and destroy it or whatever you want to do it. With these books that cost us four dollars and sixty cents, we give you the whole curriculum and then we say you can write on this, you can own it, you can, you know, don't be afraid to, um, you know, lose it. It's not going to cost you anything. These are small first steps. The big step that's happening with one of the states is we're actually now starting to create what are we calling like the micro portals where we'll connect to these schools directly and the schools will start creating their own particular content as they need. So imagine if you have a population that speaks Spanish or a population that's Chinese or Indian, you know, and we know these are micro, micro demographics. Mm -hmm. you know, in, 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 in the United States as well as the rest of the world. Now, if we let them take this stuff and create their own context, not, you know, what happens is it's not just creating the text, but it's actually creating the videos. It's actually creating the, you know, the pictures, the photos that are around your environment. If you think about, you know, going to your local environment and saying, why are the trees dying? Why is there no water here? Why doesn't it rain? And, you know, just these kind of things, they don't have to be extraordinarily creative. What they have to be is extraordinarily contextualized. Yeah. So I, I, I look at what you're doing, and to me, it's just an utter no-brainer. Every school in the country, in the world, should be accessing this. Uh, everybody should be short-selling their publishing stock. Uh, in educational publishers, why are we still buying these these you know expensive textbooks when 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 folks like you are uh, and you in particular are offering this incredible uh, service for either free or for very low cost? What are the impediments to uh, to adoption? What are you finding are the obstacles to adoption? Why why isn't everybody using this already? Um, actually, adoption is happening much easier at the higher ed level. Okay. Adoption is harder at the K-12 level because the K-12 level actually forms the basis of your knowledge, particularly K-5 and that's why when you have public education or when you're bringing in you know, more than one kid into a single space, you've got to be able to make sure that they understand certain things that they can build their knowledge on. Creativity just doesn't come by itself. It actually comes with uh, knowledge and the application of that knowledge. So, so one of the biggest problems we face in the United States as well as outside is this, how do you control that? How do you make sure every kid gets what they should be getting and are not at the mercy of individual teachers? Right? So when that happens, these policies come up. And that's really the issue. There aren't real, and policies are slow to change because, you know, the, you can't have systems changing really quickly all the time. Hence, there's this all issue about what do we allow, you know, to be basically, um, you know, uh, core curriculum versus, um, you know, supplementary, some supplementary curriculum. If you think about the open educational resources, much of that is um, the OER, the so called OER movement, much of that is making traction in the supplemental world rather than the core world. And part of it is because um, the adoption process is so gnarly that you can't go through, most of us can't afford to go through that. And it takes a long time to do that. But I, there's a movement now that, is, that states are beginning to change their minds. They're coming to me and one state said to, um, you know, the guy who's a big champion of us said to the state, CK12 has been around for now over seven years. They're showing they're here to stay. They're doing all this stuff. They're creating content. They're creating, you know, uh, features and uh, maturing our platform. What more do you want? Yeah. Right? What more do you want? I, it, it's it, it's extraordinary uh, to me uh, 
And uh, a lot of my work has been in independent schools, and I've I, I've been talking to hundreds of people over the last uh, year, and I the, this type of thing is one of the examples that I use. Uh, you know, you're, how do you how do you want to uh, decrease some of your costs? Stop spending hundreds of thousands of dollars a year on textbooks and right. use sources like this, and it's an immediate uh, discount to your to your customers right now, uh, and the obstacle there appears to be just inertia and, and, and fear of, of change. Yes, there is this, you know, because people are afraid to change, it means that each generation of teachers has to retrain themselves to think in a particular way. The digital tools lend themselves to a very different pedagogy. Mm -hmm. It's not the same pedagogy you would use for text-based learning. All of a sudden, you know, there are very many factors that kind of um, play at the same time to impact, you know, cognitive, cognitive overload, um, you know, distraction, um, the ability to easily jump from one thing to another, which is the same as distraction. But, but to be able to, you know, mindfully learn. And that's something that's going to happen not just if we wish it or if we force it. If you're going to force, like the, you know, you heard about the Los Angeles uh, Unified School District when they gave laptops, right? The kids don't want to be stopped. They want to learn. So that's the open mind that you're going to have to do. Yes, there's going to be some mess in the big, but the other mess will come. Real things. You always have to have that mess to kind of get to. So even in terms of creativity, even in terms of the learning, you can't judge it in the same way you've been judging it right now. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we had a competition where we said, okay, one of our philosophies, everything you learn, apply it to real-world application. So how does, um, you know, um, what does it mean that, how does photosynthesis happen? What are the principles around it? If you think about the physics and the chemistry around or biology around those, can you really apply those to the real world examples uh, other than photosynthesis? So we have this competition with students. We ask students to take part in this and say, hey, um, tell us, pick up a concept from our, you know, our offerings and then create an example of real world. We're going to be announcing the winners very soon, the next week or two. But that's where the creativity comes from, you know. That's a stage that we've reached with our, with our you know, uh, project. And, and every one of these projects is staged, uh, phased. So I'm looking forward to now what's going to come next um, with what, you know, what people are going to create from just a PDF version, just a content, text-based content, to really taking advantage of where do you put in a video when it counts? Where do you put in assessment? Where do you put in simulation? At what point do you start, you know, having a teacher interact with the student? Those are the kinds of things that I'm really looking forward to yeah. next. And, and, and I see from your website uh, that uh, as you folks are looking to the future, it looks like you are uh, investigating what I would call uh, differentiated or adaptive learning platform uh, technology. Is that a work in progress? Uh, with your with CK12 right now, or is that something that you're actually implementing uh, in schools uh, around the country? Uh, so right now we have the our very first phase, which is the data collection, which is offering something and then collecting the data, so that we can we can learn uh, what is it that students need. So we are absolutely moving towards that um, adaptive system learning system. Because it is that whole system, if you think about a classroom, it, it, it encompasses all that, right? A teacher, a, a teacher, a learner, the material, the, you know, the teacher finding um, the impact of the material, the assessment, you know, so that it's, it's one, one thing that kind of works by um, itself. So what we have to do is kind of duplicate that in a digital sense. So unless and until our platform offers some some semblance of that. Now, of course, you're not going to duplicate it completely. That's impossible to do. Humans are impossible to digitize like that. 
But um, in terms of um, us working towards the phases of this, each phase will continue to improve and iterate on the last one. And so that's where we are at. We are providing a very, uh, we will be providing a complete robust system with a, you know, uh, with uh, assessment and recommendation. Okay, I'm going to stop the broadcast right now. But if, uh, but I want to uh, ask.